Well, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Grasha Michelle, Professor in Debola, Vice Chancellor Delaray, members of the Mamalodi families, friends and dignitaries. I can't think of a greater honor than giving a lecture named after Nelson Mandela. I'm also thrilled that the theme of this lecture this year is living together. It's truly fitting because in many ways, living together was also the theme of Nelson Mandela's life. The system he fought against was based on the opposite idea, that people should be kept apart, that our superficial differences are more important than our common humanity. Today, South Africans are still striving to live together in the fullest sense. But you are so much closer to that ideal because Nelson Mandela and so many others believed in the promise of one South Africa. I was only nine years old when Nelson Mandela was sent to Robben Island. As a boy, I, I learned about him in school. I remember seeing reports about the anti-apartheid movements regularly on the evening news. The first time I got to speak to him was in 1994 when he called me to help fund South Africa's election. I was running Microsoft and largely focused on software most of the time. But I admired him so much and I knew the election was historic, so I did what I could to help. My first trip to Africa had been just the year before that, in 1993, when my wife Melinda and I had traveled to East Africa. The landscape was beautiful, the people were friendly, but the poverty there, which we were seeing for the first time, disturbed us. It also energized us. Obviously, we knew parts of Africa were poor, but being on the continent turned what had been an, abs an abstraction into an injustice we couldn't ignore. Melinda and I had always known that we'd give our wealth to philanthropy eventually, but when we were confronted with such glaring inequity, we started thinking about how to take action sooner. This sense of urgency was further spurred on by another trip in 1997 when I came to Johannesburg for the first time as a representative of Microsoft. I spent most of the time in the richer part of the city in business meetings, but I also went to the community center in Suedo where Microsoft was donating computers. My visit to Suedo, which was quite different then than it is now, taught me how much I had to learn about the world outside the comfortable bubble I'd lived in all my life. As I walked into the community center, I noticed there weren't any electrical connections. To keep the computer on, the one I was donating, they had rigged up an extension cord connected to a diesel generator outside. I realized the minute I left, the generator would get moved to something more important. So as I read my remarks about the importance of the technology gap, I knew that it was only a small part of the story. Computers could help people do very important things, and in fact, they are part of how life on the continent can be revolutionized. But computers alone can't cure disease or feed children. And if they can't be turned on, they can't do much at all. So after that, Melinda and I moved to start our foundation because the cost of waiting had become clear. Our work is based on the simple idea that every person, no matter where they live, should have the opportunity to lead a healthy and productive life. We've spent the past 15 years learning about the issues and looking for the leverage points where we can do the most to help people seize their opportunity. 
It was when I started coming to Africa regularly for the foundation that I got to know Nelson Mandela personally. AIDS was one of the first issues our foundation worked on, and Nelson Mandela was both an advisor and an inspiration. One thing we talked about was the stigma around AIDS. So I remember 2005 very clearly when his own son died of AIDS. Rather than stay silent about the cause of his son's death, Nelson Mandela announced it publicly because he knew that stopping the disease required breaking down the walls of fear and shame that surrounded it. It is important to recall Nelson Mandela's legacy and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do so. But Nelson Mandela was concerned about the future. He believed people could make the future better than the past. And so that's what I want to focus on for the remainder of my talk. What can South Africa become? What can Africa become? What can the world become? And what must we do to make it that way? The Millennium Development Goals adopted by the United Nations in 2000 laid a foundation that enabled the world, including Africa, to achieve extraordinary progress over the last 15 years. And the Sustainable Development Goals that recently replaced them set even more ambitious targets for creating the better world we all want. When I talk about progress, I always start with child survival because whether children are living or dying is such a basic indicator of a society's values. Since 1990, child mortality in Sub-Saharan Africa has been reduced by 54%. That means one million fewer children dying each year compared to 25 years ago. Ten African countries achieved the, the very ambitious MDG target of reducing child mortality by over two-thirds. At the same time, the incidence of poverty and malnutrition is down. And though economic growth has slowed in the past few years, it's been very robust in many African countries for more than a decade. This is real progress. But the African Rising narrative doesn't tell the whole story about the life on the continent. First, the progress has been uneven. Even. You know this very well here in South Africa. In last year's Nelson Mandela annual lecture, the French economist Thomas Piketty pointed out that income inequality in South Africa <clears throat> is, quote, higher than pretty much anywhere else in the world. In general, African countries tend to have higher rates of inequality than countries on other continents. And despite healthy average GDP growth in the region, many countries have not yet shared in it. Inequalities exist within countries and between countries. So until progress belongs to all people everywhere, the real promise of living together will remain elusive. Second, even with the great progress Africa has made, it still lags behind the rest of the world in most indicators. In Sub-Saharan Africa, one in 12 children still die before they turn five. Now that's a vast improvement compared to 25 years ago, but African children are still 12 times more likely to die than the average child in the world. And because rates of poverty and malnutrition aren't shrinking as fast as the population is growing, the number of people who are poor or malnourished has actually gone up since 1990. Finally, the progress is fragile. The continent's two largest economies here in South Africa and in Nigeria are facing serious economic challenges. And new threats require attention. The Ebola crisis pointed out weaknesses in many national health systems. The effects of climate change are already being felt among farmers in many